Adjusting to life after escaping King Creel's wasn't easy. Not at all. Wearing normal clothes and not my suit felt strange, like it was something wrong I shouldn't be doing. It was like I was an abused puppy getting used to life in a new loving home. I didn't trust anything at first. But soon enough, I started getting used to things and eventually figured out some things about myself. The first thing is the fact that, while I don't have to eat or sleep, my body is capable of doing them. Eating is a challenge as food and drinks tend to leak out of my stitched up neck. My parents have thought it best to keep me hidden from the outside world. Not that I'm complaining. People aren't exactly going to be very happy when they see what I look like. Although it did lead to some fun exchanges with the police. See, they found my dad's Zippo lighter in the charred remains of old King Creel's half-priced voodoo shop and they soon paid a visit to my parents' house. I listened in from my spot in the living room and soon heard the conversation. You're under arrest for the crime of arson, the head cop declared, twisting my dad around and slapping the cuffs on him. He protested, thrashing around while my mom pleaded and begged to let him go. Clenching my fist, I walked out of the living room and into the view of the police. Let him go, I said, walking over to them. The cops each looked at each other in confusion, clearly having thought me burned to a crisp in a blaze that had consumed their darling King Creel. I know your deal with Creel, and let's just say I've got a good witness to let the press know why the missing people in the town aren't investigated. I threatened, crossing my arms and staring at them with my button eyes. Each cop looked like they were about to shit themselves as they quickly uncuffed my dad and retreated from the door. Their hands held up as I approached them and slammed the door in their faces, looking back at my parents and confused by their scared expression. I'll explain later. And that was all I said. Man, I would. When I myself had more answers for them. To date, I'm still not convinced that King Creel died in the blaze that consumed the voodoo shop. If my dreams and the fact that I see him from time to time are any indication that the old voodoo shop bastard is still alive, I don't know what it is. I've gotten in the habit of talking with Olivia and her mother Alexandra for advice. Seeing as Alexandra is the last living person that I still have a connection to from the voodoo shop, I run a lot of ideas past her. Today, I braved the outside world, dressing up in my old hoodie with the hood up and made my way over to their house making sure to keep my buttons on the lookout for Creel. Wherever he might be, I know for a fact that he isn't exactly happy that I torched his business. Making it safely to the small house the two lived in, I rang the bell, and Olivia ran out to give me a hug like she always did. You're here! Can we play checkers? She asked me as her little arms kept themselves around me as I let myself in. I smiled and pat her head. Something about how innocent and sweet she is always recharged my body. I'll see if I have time. Where's your mommy? I asked her, to which she smiled and let go of my waist. Taking my hand, she led me to the living room where Alexandra was reading over a pile of books. And when I say a pile, I say it was stacked from the floor up to the armrests that the chair had. Catching up on world history? I asked as Olivia went off to go keep herself entertained. No, I have the Netflix for that, she said, looking at me as she sighed and put the book that she was reading down. Alexandra had been turned into a voodoo doll all the way back in 1927, so she was having some trouble adapting to all the new things that had happened since. When we told her we had a man on the moon and Britain no longer had an empire, she nearly fainted, but she had gotten used to a lot of the technology like TV and cell phones. I'm looking for a way to change you back, she said with an exhausted sigh. Many luck. The internet hasn't been much help. Either they want me to contact some of the voodoo gods or use a Ouija board or something. I sighed, sitting on the couch from across from her, picking up one of her books and raising a brow. Voodoo for dummies? I asked with a chuckle. Do not mock the knowledge of literature, Travis. 
and I do have a lead for you in regards to King Creole's mother, she said, looking around the mess of books on the floor, tapping her lips with her fingers as she looked for the correct book, finding it after a few seconds and opening it up. Here, Mama Creole, she's buried in a cemetery a few miles outside of town, she said, offering me the book to look into. I grunted as I stood up and took the book from her, looking down at the text and reading the passage. It definitely was Creel's mother, as it mentioned as the mother of the long-deceased Charles Sumner. Well, this was good information. I was more confused as to what this had to do with my current situation. What, want me to dig her up and have a nice conversation? I asked skeptically, only for my shins to be kicked by her. Okay, I kind of deserved that. Try doing a seance to contact her, Alexandra explained, handing me a slim pamphlet from the stack of books next to her. Pouting as I took the item, I looked down at it with a skeptical brow raised. Then again, if my current situation, if anything, was to go off of, I really should start believing that things that I used to believe were fake are very much real. Be respectful. Voodoo spirits can be very unpredictable. I'm sure you know that well, she said with a soft smile. I responded with a chuckle and closed the book. She then handed me some candles and a lighter, supplies for my seance. I'm sure we both know that, I responded, looking down at the pamphlet and nodding to her. Olivia came back with the doll of her old mother in her arms, coming over and hugging me just before I left. She seemed to really like me, kind of like an older brother. It is sweet, and I do show my care for her as well. Bidding them goodbye, I pulled the hoodie back over my head and googled where the cemetery would be. Luckily enough, it was within walking distance of the voodoo shop. Texting my parents and saying that I would be out for a bit, receiving pleas to not be out too long, I promised them that I wouldn't and went on my way. Walking into the old part of town, I stopped at the burnt-out remains of the voodoo shop. It was blocked off by police tape, but I easily stepped over it and entered the charred remains. I looked around at the barely recognizable store, stepping over soot and creaking wood. The big pile of ash on the floor was most likely where I lit the voodoo dolls on fire. Hearing a crunching sound, I looked down at my feet and saw a few pieces of porcelain, and my heart sank right down through the floor. Damn it. I sighed hard, leaning down and picking out the pieces and looking around for any more of them. But all I could find were those few shards of Mary. Her death tore me in many ways. She was finally free from Creel's abuse and her torture. But her manner of death really hurt me. But as long as she's finally free, I guess I shouldn't be too sad for her. Putting the porcelain shards on the charred counter, I used to stand and sleep behind. I looked around one last time before heading my way towards the cemetery. Alexandra had failed to say that this cemetery was abandoned and overgrown to shit. Even the gate had dying vines that I had to tug with all my strength to get the rusty gate open. Sighing in annoyance, I looked around the old cemetery and started to walk around, trying to find any indication of where Charles' mother was buried. Help you, son? A nasally voice asked me. Now to say I nearly shit myself is an understatement. Who the hell expects a person to suddenly ask you that question in an abandoned cemetery? Spinning on my heels, I turned my button eyes to see a tall black man in a top hat standing in a grave and leaning on a shovel a big brown cigar in his mouth as he smiled at me. The fuck is wrong with you, son? I ask you a question. He said, smoke blowing out of his nose. I, I, uh, um, I... I stammered, looking around and pulling my hood down, cautiously coming over to the strange man who was billowing smoke like a chimney. I'm looking for a grave. (laughs) Well, there's one. One over there, and... Another one over there. He snickered as he pointed to graves in every direction. He raised his brows at me to see if I was satisfied with his response. He seemingly didn't give a shit about my button eyes. Then again, I figured that he was some kind of voodoo person with his getup. Mama Creel. Her grave. 
At that name, the man stood up, his eyes big and wide as he climbed out of the grave and blew smoke right in my face and it caused me to wave the smoke out of my face. I'm a Creel, huh? Haven't heard the name in many, many years. The fuck are you gonna do with her grave? He asked me, getting right in my face. I'm so happy my sense of taste and smell is gone from being turned into a puppet. Just by looking at him, I could tell that he must have stank. I want to do a seance, I responded, tapping my button eye with my finger. See if she can help me with this, I explained to the man. He took a good look at me, finger taking the cigar out of his mouth and nodding as he rubbed his chin. Yeah, I've seen shitty work like this before, he said, standing back and blowing out more of his smoke and chuckling. His voice was high and nasally. Her grave is behind you, about six rows back. Can't miss it. It's got a big old statue of an angel on it. He pointed, causing my head to turn and look over. And when I turned to thank him, he had up and vanished on me. Stupid voodoo people, getting to teleport and shit. Making my way through the overgrown and gravestones, I did indeed come upon a giant angel statue. Yes, King Creel wanted to make sure his mom was remembered all right. Scraping off the moss, I was greeted by the words, Mama Creel. So this was her grave. Kneeling down before it, I put out the candles that Alexandra had given me and carefully lit them. Didn't want to start a fire in this place. All right, let's see if this will work. I sighed, kneeling on my knees and sighing. Mama Creel, um, my name is Travis. Your son has given me a voodoo curse, and I humbly beg you to lift it, if you can. I looked at the grave, expecting something to happen. The candles flickered a bit, but other than that, not much else happened. <sighs> I figured that wouldn't work at all. I said, about to give up. Until a rotting hand shot through the ground and grabbed me by the arm. Now that did get a loud scream out of me and the hand yanked me down as it pulled itself up. And sure enough, a woman-infested skull burst through the ground and met my brown eyes, keeping me in a death grip and pulling itself until it was about waist-deep in the dirt the corpse finally let go. Standing up, I tumbled backward against the grave behind me and stared at the corpse. How can I help you, dear? The corpse asked me in a sweet and caring voice. Now that really threw me off. I know they don't say judge a book by its cover, but when the cover is rotting and full of worms, I probably wouldn't read that book. Um, Mamba Creel? I asked hesitantly, getting a nod from the corpse. Some of its maggots fell to the ground as it did. Well, I had my answer. I was currently talking to King Creel's mother. I need your help. I said after sitting back up from my backward tumble. Obviously, dear. You don't just call on me if you have nothing to chat about. <laughs> she giggled, waiting for me to get over the fact that I was talking to a corpse. Still not the weirdest thing that happened to me if I'm going to be really honest with myself. Your son Charles, he cursed me. Well, really, he murdered me, then brought me back to life to be his puppet... Is there any way for you to reverse it? I asked her, looking into those vacant eye holes to try and get any kind of idea as to what she was going to say. And it wasn't what I was expecting. Oh, you're that, Travis, she said in a disgusting tone, pulling herself up further out of the grave, clenching my arm again and pulling me back into her face. The same Travis that dared to hurt my darling boy? She hissed, opening her jaw up and leaning in to bite me. He tried to kill my parents! I shouted back at her, pushing her moly corpse and trying to keep her away from me. Why does this always happen to me? I really should have gone to college instead of taking this stupid voodoo job. He's out of control and killing innocent people! I shouted, still struggling with the surprisingly strong corpse. He was teaching you a lesson, you ungrateful puppet. Taking a large bite out of my arm. Luckily, her teeth didn't get through thanks to my hoodie sleeve. Looking around for a weapon, I grabbed one of the candles and shoved it into her face. 
The sizzling of a rotting face was enough to get her to let go. I quickly blew out the candles and soon enough, she was seemingly dragged back into her grave by some unseen force, hurling every insult known to man at me. So much for her being able to help me. Should have figured the woman who created King Creel, in both senses of the word, would stand by him no matter what he did. Well, now I was back to square one, packing up the things that I came with. I quickly got out of there and started on my way home, being sure to avoid the voodoo shop this time. Making it home, I skipped on eating and just went to my room, plopping myself on the bed with a loud and annoying groan. I would have passed out if something hadn't started pulling at my hair. <sighs> yes, Tempe, I asked in an annoying groan, turning my head to look at the voodoo doll. He waved his little arm at me and held up a scrap of paper. He was learning how to write better and must have been reading the alphabet books my mom used to get me while I was in kindergarten. Sighing as I sat up in bed, I took the little scrap of paper and read it. Basement. Something down. Okay, maybe he still isn't the best at writing. But he's still getting there at least. I looked at him confused. Thinking at first he meant my basement... Then it clicked and remembered the store's basement door. I looked over at the desk where I had put the basement door key. Then I looked back at him. If he's down there and causes my death, I'm going to be so pissed at you. I declared at my little template friend. Getting out of bed and taking the key and shoving it in my pocket. Once again telling my parents I was going out. This time I didn't say that I was going to the voodoo shop. They'd lock me up in my room if I told them that that's where I was going. Pulling my hood over my head and heading off towards the voodoo shop, I was having second thoughts about this, and they got worse once I was again ducking under the police tape and entering the burnt-out shell of a shop. Swallowing a lump in my throat, I approached the scorched basement door. Producing the key from my pocket, I inserted it into the keyhole and opened up the door. It was as dark and endless as it was always producing my phone and walking into the darkness. I held my breath the entire way down. The stairs were spared from the flames that engulfed the store, most likely thanks to the door, so I didn't have to worry about falling through them. Although, when I finally touched the solid stone, I stood there for a good solid minute, too afraid to move a muscle. Come on, Travis, you've got this, man. My weak attempt at a pep talk did manage to make me walk a few steps as I looked around the basement. To my surprise, the entire basement was empty. No bodies, no tables where I got my head cut off, no nothing. I was kind of disappointed, really. I half expected all those corpses that dragged Creel away to still be down here. Slightly bolstered, I walked my way deeper into the basement to look around for something. There had to be a reason Tempe had sent me down there. And then I tripped over it. Landing flat on my face with a hard thud. I looked at what had caused me to trip. Creel's cane. That really caused me to have some traumatic flashbacks. Getting beaten by the thing on nearly a daily basis still caused me to wake up and expect the pain to come to me. It was Creel's favorite way of getting me from behind the counter. Sitting up, I reached out and grabbed the item. Rubbing the white head of it and sighing, I used it to help me get back up. You found my old cane. An all too familiar voice said to me, causing me to freeze in place and clutch the item in my hand for dear life. Turning around, my fears were confirmed when I saw him sitting in the same comfy chair I've seen in my dreams. Be a good boy and bring me that cane, Travis. He hummed, beckoning me to come over. I took backward steps and turned to run, only to slam into a stone wall that suddenly was behind me. You can't do this to me. You're dead. I shouted at him, lifting the cane up and ready to smack him in his stupid smiling face. He chuckled at me and stood up from the chair. The wall suddenly started to push me towards the voodoo king. I've died before. I'll most likely die again. But as long as I have a way back, I'll never let you go, Travis. You belong to me he said sweetly, like the tone of a parent saying that they aren't mad, just disappointed. 
Soon the wall had pushed me all the way to him and grabbed me by the throat. Easily he caught my futile attempt at hitting him with the cane and he yanked it from my hands. You, you forgot one thing, I choked out as he strangled me. He looked at me with some confusion before I rammed my head into his, causing him to grunt and fall backwards against the chair. Reaching down, I picked up the cane he had dropped and swung it against him, hitting him in the head and lifting the cane up to do it again. You don't have control over me, I huffed, lifting up the cane higher to do it again, until I felt something wrap around my arm. Don't I? He asked with a chuckle, spitting out some of the black sludge from his mouth. I looked up in horror as the strings began to descend upon me. This couldn't be happening. I yanked my arm against the strings and tried to break it. I even tried chewing through the fucking thing. Soon another string came and wrapped itself around my other arm. Pulling both arms hard, I was forced to dangle a couple of inches off the ground. Mama told me that you visited her, he said with a chuckle, getting off the floor and dusting himself off. He stood and picked up the cane that I had dropped and marveled at it with some appreciation. Yeah, she looked almost as ugly as you. I shot back, receiving a hard smack from the cane against my face. I don't even know why I said that. Guess I was just pissed off at ending up in this situation again. I must teach you some manners, since your parents clearly didn't. He chuckled, lifting his cane up to smack me again, only for him to be grabbed by the shoulder. We both looked to the hand in confusion. Only Creel was spun around and decked right in the face, sending him flying into me and falling to the floor. Whatever had hit Creel stepped out into my field of view and instantly melted my heart. Mary, I called out. Mary appeared to me as she looked when Creel had forced her to sing on stage. She smiled at me and shook her head. Part of your master plan, huh? She asked me, coming over and cutting me down from my string captors. Rubbing my wrists, I quickly wrapped my arms around her and hugged her tight. She patted me on the back before pushing me away. You have to wake up quickly. Take the cane with you, she said, pointing to the item. Creel nowhere to be seen. I quickly nodded and grabbed the item. Now what? I asked, only for her to stab me in the leg with a metal nail filer, sending me screaming and suddenly waking up on the stone floor of the basement. I looked around in confusion. Had I dreamed all that? Well, judging by the fact that I had the cane in my hands, it... Must have been real. Great. Now I'm in some nightmare on Elm Street shit. I looked around before I stood up and held onto the cane, heading back upstairs and quickly closing the door behind me. Rubbing my head, I looked around and saw that night was quickly falling. How long had I been down there? I shrugged it off and quickly made my way out of the burnt out shop and off on my way home. Making it home, I was scolded and hugged by my parents who had been worried sick over me. I said that I was sorry and that I promised to come down and eat something after I was done with something that I had to do in my room. Heading up there, I opened the door and looked at Tempe sitting on my bed. You're in big trouble, I huffed, tossing the cane on the bed and watching as he stood up and examined it. So he's in my dreams now or something? I asked Tempe, who merely shrugged at me. As in the dark in this as I was, both of us were startled when a fucking rock came through my window. Landing on the bed, it was covered in blood. Looking over to the window, I stuck my head out to see who had done it, then instantly stuck my head back in and covered my mouth as to not scream. Standing on the street was the rotting corpse, and next to it was Creel. When I poked my head back out to see again, they were gone. Great. Now I have two angry voodoo creatures after me. I did not leave my room for almost two days after I saw the two standing down on my street. Let's just say, seeing two people that want me dead were staring at me from my street and driveway really made me kind of want to just hide in my room. But they didn't do anything. And soon, they disappeared and 
caused me to quickly call Alexandra. After about two minutes of her trying to figure out how to use the phone, she finally got the hang of it. Hello? She said rather loudly, causing me to take the phone away from my ear. Alexandra, you don't have to shout. I can hear you just fine. I chuckled, putting the phone back to my ear. I could tell the gears in her head turning before she apologized for shouting at me. It was an easy thing to shrug off, especially with what life has become. Were you able to talk to King Creole's mother? She asked, causing me to check out the window to check if the woman in question would suddenly appear just by the mention of her name. Oh yeah, I did. She was not happy to meet me and now I think her corpse is walking around and wants to kill me. I said, sitting on my bed with a groan. Tempe climbed up on my lap soon enough and offered a scrap of paper with a heart on it. Gosh, this guy really has changed since staring angrily at me whenever I was on my phone. Oh, no. I feared this may happen. Were you respectful to her? Alexandra quickly asked, the sound of books being flipped through. If by respectful you mean sticking a candle in her face, then yeah, I was the most respectful to her, I answered. The long period of silence told me that she was certainly not amused by my attempt to make a joke out of the situation. Did you at least tell her goodbye? She asked, exasperated. Was I supposed to do that? I asked her with a raised brow. The sounds of her books falling off onto the floor painted the picture of her face palming. In my defense, I only skimmed that long ass list of things I was supposed to do for a seance. This is bad, Travis. Very, very bad. She groaned, stacking the books back on her lap and sighing hard. I think you've angered her spirit enough for her to cross back into the mortal realm. Well, that explains why her and Creel were outside my house the other day. This time I heard her hand smack on her forehead. I'm pretty sure that I was causing her to age rapidly just through this conversation. What else did you screw up? Her tone was one of worry. Fair enough. At this point, I belong in the Looney Tunes episode with how incompetent I was in doing all of this. I met a black guy with a top hat and he was smoking a cigar. He told me where Mama Creel was buried. I said... Once again, all her books falling to the floor. I'm guessing she stood up from the chair that she was sitting in. You what? She shouted, causing me to pull the phone away again. Did you meet Baron Somdi without even knowing it? Now I've heard that name before. Mostly thanks to you guys and my previous attempts of escaping the half-priced voodoo store. He's a voodoo loa. Basically a spirit. He's a spirit of the dead. So, kind of makes sense that I found him in a graveyard. I guess I did. He blew smoke in my face and showed me where Mama Creel was buried. Then he was gone, I told Alexandra, who was quickly running around and probably finding a book on Loa's. I waited for her to finish before I asked her, Why? Can he help me or am I going to have an evil voodoo god on my ass as well? He might be able to help you, but you need to do it very carefully and don't screw it up, she said in a disappointed mother's tone. Agreeing, I pulled the notepad out and started to scribble what she told me. You need to offer him cigars, rum, coffee, or even simple bread. Then he might decide to help you. Might? What do I got to offer him, a human sacrifice too? I asked skeptically, only to be yelled at to take this seriously. Pouting as I wrote down her instructions, I finally got everything written down and hung up on her with a promise that I wouldn't fuck this up. Heading downstairs, I went into my dad's office and opened his cigar box, shoving a couple into my pockets and borrowing his Zippo lighter. Looking around in his liquor cabinet, I was annoyed to find no rum so I hoped that the cigars were enough. Telling my mom I wouldn't be back, she warned me about the fact that it was going to rain, but I shrugged it off. That was what hoodies were for, after all. Running off towards the cemetery again, I checked around the alleyways and lampposts to make sure that the gruesome duo weren't anywhere near me, making it into the cemetery. 
I entered the same path that I cut open last time and went in, looking around for any signs of the Loa. Um, Baron Samadhi, I've got an offer for you if you want them. I shouted out in the abandoned cemetery. Walking around, I took the chance and went to check on Mama Creel's grave, and swallowed hard when I saw that the grave had been emptied of all of its contents. The hell you want, boy? A nasally voice suddenly asked me, causing me to look behind myself and nearly stumble into the empty grave. The top hat wearing black man looked down at me with a raised brow as he looked down. Swallowing hard, I reached into my pockets and pulled out the cigars. His tone changed as he gave me a rotting yellow-toothed smile as he took one and smelled it. Sticking it in his mouth, he chewed off the end and spit it on the ground. A uh, uh, light? I asked him, holding up the zippo and flicked it to life. He smiled at me and leaned in, taking a few puffs of the cigar and getting it going and blowing out a steam of smoke. He nodded with a chuckle and looked down at me. Ah, what can I do for you? He asked me, his tone much more friendly as he took in the scent of the cigar, which was more excited and happy. I need your help. Can you save me from King Creel and his mother? I asked him in desperation. He looked down at me as he happily puffed away on my dad's cigar, stroking his chin and chuckling as he looked down at me and tapping some of the ash onto me. Sorry, Sonny. Can't do anything. Mama Creel and I go far back, and I can't go back on it. He shrugged, and I stared at him in horror. It really seemed like everything wanted to fuck me with a barbed wire bat. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to turn you over to her. I'm far too busy to care for about what she and her spoiled brat do. He waved it off, holding the cigar in his mouth. But you also won't help me? I asked him, and he looked at me with a raised brow and chuckled. <laughs> Look, I hate a son more than anything. But she has a deal with me. Keep his rotten corpse alive no matter what. But since you gave me this beautiful cigar, I'll make a deal with you, he said with a smile. I would have accepted his offer no question, except the crack of thunder and strike of lightning showed me that the Baron was a skeleton, staring down at me. Wait, wait, I'll give you all of this, I shouted, sticking my hands into my pockets and showing off the cigars. His eyes nearly leaped out of his head when he saw all of them. I'll give them all to you. If you give me a good deal, no strings attached, I said, handing over the cigars. I like you, kid. You're smart, he said with a toothy grin, chewing on the cigar that he already had and nodding happily. All right, kid. I'll give you a hint as to how to beat him. He chuckled happily and blew smoke into my face again. Force him into the ground. I'll take care of the rest, he said with a smile. I stared at him in confusion, but when he blew smoke in my face, I coughed up a storm. And when I saw that he was gone, I sighed hard in annoyance. God, I hate riddles. Walking back home as the rain started and thunder cracked loud, I looked down at the ground as I thought of the riddle. I stepped in puddles as I made my way into my neighborhood, and when I got to my house, I froze in place, as my front door was open and split in half. Rushing inside, I looked around the house in horror as I looked for any sign of my mother. And I found her all right. Travis, my boy. A familiar voice greeted me. He sat in my dad's chair, smiling with his stitched up mouth as he took a sip of coffee from a cup, with my mother's head sitting on the table next to him. My legs gave out as I fell to the floor, covering my mouth and shivering. Your mother makes a beautiful cup of coffee. Shame this was her last one. He giggled, smiling at me and standing up, tossing the cup to the floor and walking over to me. You fucking monster! I screamed, standing up and rushing to tackle him, only to be struck in the back of the head and falling next to him. Looking up, I was met by a tan-skinned woman dressed in one of my mother's dresses, her hair was black and curled as she looked down at me like she stepped on a bug. Sweetheart, are you sure he's the one you want to keep? 
she asked Creel, handing him the item that he had hit me with, which turned out to be his cane. He aptly took the item and pushed my cheek hard as he weighed down on it. Yes, Mama. Since he took Mary away from me, I want him to be her replacement, he said with a smile, replacing his cane with his dress shoe, grinding it into my face and chuckling all the way. You piece of shit! I snarled, trying to push him off of me, only for me to get hit in the head again with this cane. That certainly brought back some fun memories. You'll never get away with this. I swear to God, I'll rip you to fucking pieces! I screamed at him. Both he and his mother were smiling at my pathetic attempts to escape. I know I had to do something, and the item in my pocket was the only thing that I could think of. Reaching into my pocket, I brought the Zippo out and lit it up and put it up to Creel's suit pants. You little shit! He screamed, pulling his foot away and slapping the growing flames on his legs. His mother gasped and tried to help him put the fire out. Pushing myself up and heading towards the stairs, I ran up to my room and slammed the door, huffing hard as I shoved the door against it. I slid down the door as I shivered at the thought of my dead mother. I curled apart and planted my face into my hands. I wish I could shed a tear for her, but my button eyes prevented me. But my body still acts as if it could cry. The sound of them slamming against the door and clawing at it caused me to stand up and look around the room. I saw Tempe jumping up and down on the desk, pulling my attention over to him. I went over to him and picked him up, shoving him into my pocket and scribbling down on a note for my dad. Hopefully he would read my horrible handwriting. Going to the window, I slid, stepped out of it, and crawled across the roof, heading down the drain pipe and running away from my house as fast as I could. I arrived at the house of Alexandra and Olivia and stumbled into Alexandra's arms as I cried into her, barely being able to tell her what had happened. She quickly took me inside and sat me in a chair, raining off to get me towels. Sitting there and crying into my hands, I felt some arms wrapped around me. Looking up from my hands, I saw it was Olivia hugging my leg and trying to make me feel better. Smiling a bit, I patted her head and reached into my pocket, showing off Tempe to her, which caused her to gasp and ask to play with him. As Alexandra arrived with towels, she wrapped me up in them and sat next to me with a hard sigh. She hugged me and assured me that I was safe here. She patted me on the back and tried to get me to tell her what had happened. He cut my mother's head off. And his mother isn't a rotting corpse anymore. She's got skin and shit now. I mumbled, pulling the towels around me and wrapping them tighter. I lit him on fire again and ran off. I said sadly, looking up at her and sighing hard. It doesn't surprise me. She is a master at voodoo and most likely only appears to be human again. She most likely is using a spell to appear human again. Alexandra explained, rubbing my shoulders lovingly, trying to keep me from breaking down and crying all over again. Did you get in contact with Baron Somdi? She asked. Yeah. He's got a deal with Mama Creel to keep Charles alive. He only offered to help with a stupid riddle, I said with a sigh, looking up at her when she made a gesture to tell me what it was. Force him in the ground. I'll take care of the rest, I explained. She looked at me and stroked her own chin and thought, looking at me and asking Olivia to get one of the books over on the table. She nodded, carefully putting Tempe down on the table and grabbing the book, running over and handing it to her mother. She thanked her daughter and flipped through the book. Hmm. He is the Loa of the Dead. My best guess is to put King Creel in a grave. He'll then most likely lead his soul to the underworld. Alexandra thought out loud, looking at me. I gave her a skeptical look. Ah, yes. I'll lay on the ground and you push him over into the grave that we had dug for him. I mumbled to her, getting kicked in the shins for my smart mouth. Rubbing my leg, I sighed and looked at her. Even if we get him in a grave, what's stopping him from coming back? He said he would take care of the rest. I guess we must simply get him in the ground. She said, closing the book and looking at me. Our silence was broken by the window being broken, and my mother's head rolling to my feet. I looked at it and 
looked over to the window. You left something at home, Travis. Creel's voice ran out, laughing at me. I stood up and walked over to the window and stared in anger at the voodoo king standing on the sidewalk. He smiled back and waved at me. He can't come in. He wouldn't hurt Olivia. It's the one thing he won't do. She explained, pulling me away from the window and covering my mother's head with a towel. She sat me back down and went back to the window, clearing her throat. <clears throat> King Creole, I would appreciate it if you leave my property. She said softly. He looked at her with a tilt to his head and shrugged, tipping his top hat and walking off down the street. You'll still find a way to get in, I said with a mumble, looking at the lump of towel on the floor, curling up in the chair and sighing hard. Travis, it's so cold. So cold. A voice came from the towel. I looked at it and reached a trembling hand out to pull the towel away, seeing that my mother was staring at me with a sorrowful expression. It's so dark and cold. She mumbled. I stared at her and stood up, walking off to the bathroom and locking myself in there. I spent a long time in there, covering my ears and just dry sobbing. The fucking monster killed my mom, and the last thing I said to her was that I loved her. I wish I could have hugged her and taken her with me to keep her safe. It's all my fault. It took me four hours to get out of Alexandra's bathroom, and by the time I finally managed enough strength to get out, Alexandra had removed my mother's head and assured me that she was in a better place. The usual crap that gets said to you when a loved one dies. Olivia offered a hug to me and I gladly accepted. Even Tempia gave me a hug in the best way that he could. Afterward, Alexandra let me sit up and cope with everything while she went about trying to come up with a way to get Creel into a grave. Soon my phone started ringing and what I feared happened had happened. My dad had found my decapitated mother sitting at the kitchen table. To say that he was hysterical was an understatement. Hey dad, I said when I answered the phone, pulling the phone away from my ear as he talked a million miles an hour, asking what had happened, if I was safe, who could have done it, you know, that sort of thing. It was my boss, I answered simply. I'll rip that fucking bastard's head off, my dad screamed, sighing as I rubbed my button eyes with my hands and looked at Alexandra for any kind of reassurance. But she was nose deep in another book, so I wasn't going to get anything from her at the moment. No, you won't, dad. He's more dangerous than you could ever... No. Let's just get out of town, okay? I'll handle this. Just get out before something happens to you. I can't lose you, too. I whimpered to him. That seemingly got him out of his murderous rage. He calmed down and became easier to talk to. <sighs> Alright, son. If you think that that's the best course of action for us, he said with a long sigh. It was obvious that he was holding in all of his pain and loss at that moment. Be safe, son. I can't lose you again, either, he said. A rare moment of emotion from my father. It brought a sad smile to my face. I nodded and said that I loved him. He returned the favor and we both hung up. Sinking back into the chair, Olivia tugged at my jeans and forced me to look down over to her. She climbed up onto my lap and hugged my torso. She was a really good kid. I can't think of any way of getting King Creole into a grave. Alexandra sighed, coming back into the living room and sitting on the couch next to us. But the annoying frown turned into a smile when she saw the scene before her. Come here, Livy. Let's let Travis rest for a bit. He's been through a lot today. Olivia obeyed and came over to her mother. Nah, I'm okay, I said standing up and looking at the spot where my mother's head had landed. Shaking it off, I looked over to the street and stroked my chin for thought. The shop is out of the question. The basement floor is stone and who knows what's under the floorboards, I sighed. 
and most likely his mother knows all too well her son's weakness. Alexander responded to Olivia, sitting on her lap and looking up while her mother brushed her hair. So luring him to a graveyard is also out of the question. What about pushing him into a hole? Olivia asked, wanting to be part of this conversation. I thought about it and then realized something. Force him into the ground. That doesn't mean it has to be a grave. Hell, I can force him into a ditch and that counts as the ground, I said, looking to the mother-daughter duo, who looked back at me with raised eyebrows. Alexander looked down at Olivia and then up to me. I have a very intelligent daughter. She hummed with a proud smile. Her accent was just a bit more posh than usual. Our moment of excitement was cut off by a loud thud upstairs, and we both looked up in terror. What was that? I asked in hushed fear. It came from Olivia's room. Alexander mumbled, looking down at Olivia. The little girl also looked up, the gears in her young head, thinking about what could be in her room at that moment. The only thing up there is the dolly that Mr. King Creel gave me, she said, causing me and Alexandra to look at each other in terror. There was no way. He wouldn't dare stoop that low. Would he? The loud thuds coming down the stairs behind us quickly dispelled and any doubts that we had. You little shit! came a screech as someone dragged itself down the stairs. Sophie, Olivia's old mother, was dragging herself down the stairs. Only the woman was looking worse for fear. She still appeared to be half doll, but also half human as such. She was once again a full-sized human, but some of her body still appeared to be made of fabric, and the parts that were made of skin were sewn tight to their fabric counterparts. She was bleeding and unable to stand on her legs, which seemingly had no bones in them. Olivia screamed at the sight of her original mother and clamored into Alexandra's arms. The mother quickly scooped up her daughter and put some distance between her and the woman whose daughter she had taken. I armed myself with the only thing at arm's length, a heavy-ass book. The creature called towards us as we backed up, and to break the tension, I threw the heavy-ass book at her. The fact that I cracked her face straight down the middle didn't seem to bother her. In fact, she just spawned long needle-like teeth all the way down, then split into her head. Maybe we should run, I said quickly. We got nods from both girls, and all of us booking it all the way to the house and out onto the streets. I headed towards the car as Alexandra and Olivia piled with me. Do you know how to drive this automobile? Alexander asked me in a panic as I buckled myself in. I looked at her and nodded. Yeah, I took one semester at driver's ed. Just because I didn't finish it didn't mean that I didn't know how to drive. Throwing it in reverse, I smashed their mailbox, but after that, I managed to get out onto the street and gun it. It might have been a bit bumpy any time I tried to break, but it wasn't too bad if I do say so myself. All right, well, now where do we go? I asked the pair, keeping my eyes on the road and praying no cop tried to pull me over. Although my looks, I'm sure that they'd probably let me go. I do look like a guy that they work for, after all. Perhaps your house? You do not have any kind of voodoo in there, do you? Alexandra asked me as she stroked Olivia's head. The little girl was curled up, her head resting in her mother's head. Poor girl. No, None except... Tempe! I suddenly realized, slamming the brakes hard and searching my pockets for him. I looked back at Olivia to see that she had brought him, and thanks to whatever messed up God that there was, she did. The doll was busy being squeezed by the afraid little girl. I breathed a sigh of relief as I turned back to continue driving. Yeah. Except for him. We should be okay. I sighed as I drove us to my house. Arriving there, I saw that my dad's car was long gone. I entered the house first, hoping that my dad had moved my mother's headless body. He had, and I thanked him for that. Lighting them in, I sat them both down on our living room couch and went to go put on some coffee and find something for Olivia to try and eat. Stepping over the puddle of blood, I went to the sink and washed out the coffee pot. She's asleep, Alexandra said as she entered the kitchen also stepping over the blood puddle and coming over to me. How long has it been since you've eaten? She asked me, looking at my pale face with some bit of concern. Um, a couple of days. I don't need to really eat like this. 
I said, going and starting up the coffee machine. I received a sympathetic rub on my arm, causing me to sigh hard and shake my head. Try to eat something. I'll handle the coffee, she said with a soft smile. I responded with a defeated nod and made my way over to the cabinets, opening them. I was instantly greeted by a familiar face. Travis, my boy, you wouldn't believe how long I've been waiting for you. He chuckled, reaching his foot out and kicking me in the face, sending me crashing against Alexandra and landing flat on my ass. He easily hopped out of my cabinets and straightened himself up in nice and good. I backed up away from him as he approached me and Alexandra. You were waiting here for my dad, weren't you? I shouted, standing up and grabbing the first thing in arm's length, which turned out to be the coffee pot. Swinging it around, I managed to smash it over his head, sending him back a bit and soon enough, causing him to lean against the wall, covering his head as his hat fell from his messy black hair. Maybe I was and maybe I wasn't. The important thing is that I have you and this traitor in the same place at the same time. He chuckled, reaching down and picking up his hat, dusting it off with some dramatic flair. He placed it back on his head with a chuckle. Don't worry, Olivia, either. Mama always was a good babysitter, he said with a smile, the stitches on his mouth nice and tight as he did so. Alexander grew pale as she looked out the kitchen towards the couch where she had left Olivia to sleep. A creel stepped between us and into the living room. His cane tapped on the floor with malice as he began to close the distance between him and us. I looked to Alexandra, who was shaking in fear, looking back at my former boss. I swallowed some of that fear and placed myself in front of her and Creel. Hey, fuck you, Charles! I sneered, grabbing him by the collar and slamming him against the wall. My act of bravado was quickly subdued once I was hit in the head again by a hard object, sending me slumped against the voodoo king. He caught me easily and chuckled patting my head with his gloved hands. Thank you, Alexandra. I always knew that you were a good girl. I cocked my head back in horror as he said those words. Alexandra stood with a pot in her hands. Another betrayal. And this one hurt most of all of them. She looked away from me, tears in her eyes as she backed away and let the voodoo creature take me away from my own house. As I slipped into unconsciousness, I cursed under my breath. I'm sorry, Travis. She mumbled at me. And I didn't really blame her. Between me and Olivia, I would have chosen her as well. No hard feelings, Alexandra. Although at the time, I wanted to call her every swear word in the book. But I was dragged away and slipped into the ether as I was dragged out of my home. Wake up, young man. A woman's voice said tapping my cheek with some force to wake me up. As the vision came back to my buttons, I looked around confused. This wasn't the store or even the basement. It was another stage, similar to the one that Charles had dedicated a song to to his mother form. I was tied to a chair and looked around as everything became clear. You? You're Mama Creel? I asked with a raised brow as I struggled against the ropes keeping me bound. She smiled at me and nodded pulling a chair out and sitting down in front of me, seeing her in good light and right in front of her. She was certainly looking good for her age, especially since last I saw her she was a rotting corpse. Her skin was tan like caramel and she had big black locks. Charles certainly has a liking for you. He's a sweet boy and I'm so happy he's made a friend. She said with a smile and a sigh. She suddenly produced a makeup kit and patted me with it. It appeared to be white powder. Now, ever since I was turned into a voodoo puppet, my skin has been as chalk white as Creel's, so smashing my white face with white powder seemed just pointless. Some friend he is to me, I mumbled under the constant smashings of the pad. She stopped and suddenly shoved a knife blade at my face, lowering the blade and plucking at the stitches around my throat. I swallowed hard as I stood still and she smiled as she dragged the knife across my throat. My, he did a very good job of bringing you back to life. He really was paying attention all those years. She smiled, pulling me back and going back to cleaning me up. 
producing some red paint and touching up my cheeks. It was like she was getting me ready for some kind of show. And with that thought came across my mind, I instantly started to panic. Wait, is he going to make me dance again? I mumbled, holding as still as I could as she touched up my cheeks. Please don't. I can't do that again. I begged her. She stopped from painting me and looked at me, pursing her lips in some thought as she looked me up and down. I know how painful it must feel, dear. But can you imagine what my poor Charles went through? When that whore and her thugs ripped out his eyes and cut off his head, my sweet baby boy didn't deserve that. She sighed, producing a comb and started brushing my messy black hair back down into the combed state that it used to be in. I don't deserve this. I shouted at her, receiving a hard smack from her when I did so. She looked down at me like I was scum and grabbed me by the hair like Creel used to do when he was beyond pissed off. Know this, young man. I might have sided with you if you hadn't burnt his store down and attempted to kill him with his own victims. She snarled, shoving me back and going back to combing me. Yep, she was just as crazy as her son. Maybe all those years in the dirt really sent her into a downward spiral. Or me waking her up made her grouchy. Mama, are you almost done? A familiar voice asked from behind the stage. Creel's voice poking out from behind the curtain. I craned my neck back to try and see, but it was forced back into place and I received another smack from his mother. Almost done, baby. She hummed, waving him away behind the counter and smiling at me. You know... He's always wanted to post one of those stories like you do. Maybe after this performance he can. She asked with a smile, and I only responded with silence. Nodding as if agreeing with her, she stood up and made her way down the stage and seats and sat in the front row. And after a few moments the ropes tied around me fell off and soon the strings came back down. And I stared up in horror and tried to run only to fall to the stage floor and look back to see that my shoelaces had been tied together, and that once again, I was back in a suit. Oh god. It was happening again. And now... came a thundering voice from seemingly nowhere. The strings firmly attached themselves to me again, despite my thrashings and biting at them. Soon they forced me to my feet, the familiar hard thug of them sending my body stiff and unresponsive to my brain's signals. But they responded to someone else. A performance of great proportions, Travis the Dancing Puppet, came the thundering voice. My stiff body was forced to bow before the crowd of Creel's mother. A smile forced back onto my face and I stood at attention. The sweet melodies of a piano began to play, and I already knew who it was. But the announcer made the obvious known. And the pianist extraordinaire himself, King Creel! The announcer shouted, and Creel appeared in a puff of smoke. The melody turned to fast keystrokes as he went to town on the keys. I bit my tongue in anticipation of the pain, but nothing could prepare for it. But when the strings pulled tight and forced me to dance... It was like I was tied to two horses being pulled apart. Every swing and step that I took was like a nail in each and every inch of my body. Mama Creo clapped in delight as she watched the scene. I smiled my stupid smile as I was forced to dance faster and faster, as Creo seemingly picked up the pace of his playing with every dance move I made. He knew full well how much this hurt, and he wanted me to feel each and every tug and pull of the strings. I don't know how long he went on for, but when it was finally over, I felt like I was barely being kept together with shitty scotch tape. I hung limply from the strings. They were keeping me dangled up about an entire three or four feet from the ground, and it soon felt as if my arms would be ripped off. A beautiful performance. Mama Creo clapped, walking up on stage and throwing her arms around her son. He smiled and chuckled as he looked over at me, tilting his head at me and enjoying the throbbing pain that I was in. You look good like that, Travis. Maybe I'll keep you like that. Keeps you from 
snooping around. He said with a smile, taking his cane from his mother's hands and swinging it against my side. If the strains making me dance was like a million tiny paper cuts at once, that swing of his cane was like being thrown into salt in a lemon bath with all of my paper cuts. It was blinding pain as I screamed out. Charles, don't play with your toys like that. Mama Creel hissed, walking over and stopping him from swinging at me again. Save it for tomorrow when he feels even worse. She hummed, kissing his forehead and pulling him away. They talked for a few minutes before leaving me suspended from the stage. In complete darkness. I'm fucking back here again. My only ally has thrown me under the bus. And here I am back with the fucking strings and forced to dance for the psycho and his mother. I'll get out of here. I'll show him. <laughs> How about King Creel takes over for a spell? Travis needs a break. After all. My, my, my. I'm sure many of you are very concerned about Travis, but don't be. He's safely suspended from the stage where I left him. Just let him have some rest and let King Creel have a chance to talk to y'all. Now, I must say, many of you seem to hate me. Maybe even despise me for kicking little old Travis like he's a puppy. Some in particular are very hostile towards me. And I can understand that. If you've all been hearing from a biased source after all, I would hate me as well. But why should I care about what any of you think? After all, you were some of the same people that turned my puppet against me. Started planting all of those doubts into his little mind. Think about it. If faceless creatures started planting doubts in something you care about. But I don't hold grudges. Especially with possible future clients. Travis has been rather good at detailing what working for me once looked like. And of course, you know the tragic story of Charles Sumner. But Travis is leaving a big old hole in that story. Something that for some reason he didn't say. And that concerns the sweet Ms. Elizabeth. Or, as she liked to be called, Liz. From his account, I forced him to take the young Miss Liz down into the basement and turned her into a doll. And I did that. I won't deny my beautiful work after all. But he didn't tell you all of what happened shortly after I tied her down. Now, if you recall, I had been very rudely shot several times in the face by young Liz. Needless to say, I wasn't exactly happy about the situation. But I wasn't not one to worry over such trivial situations. Travis stood dutifully next to me as my body healed itself. Liz thrashed and yelled out for Travis to help her. But the strings kept him docile and under my control. Travis... Be a good boy and look away for this part. We must be respectful of the young lady. I hummed as I produced a knife from my suit pocket. Travis was forced to turn around by the strings and be kept still as I sliced off Liz's clothes. Now, some of you may think me a pervert, but I assure you that I take no pride in doing such things to a woman. It simply makes the process easier if she is nude. Finishing up with that, I made my way over to Travis. Anything else, sir? He asked me in that cheery tone I love so much. His button eyes looked into mine, and I knew in his mind he was wishing he could do what Henry and his thugs did to me a hundred times over. But now, he was safely under my control. Just stay here while I get the necessary materials. I smiled, patted him on the back, and headed to the corner to grab some pieces of porcelain, making sure that whore was in her proper place in the corner. 
I knew the whole time that she and Travis were planning a way of escape, but I was confident enough that it would fail, and I was interested to see where it was gonna go all wrong. As I gathered the pieces of porcelain I needed, I heard Miss Liz let out a loud scream. I looked over confused and saw Travis climbing on top of her. Now, for a moment I thought I had lost control over him, but I still felt the strings connected to my fingers. So what was he doing? More importantly, why wasn't he standing in place as I told him to do? Travis, what the hell do you think that you are doing? I shouted at him, standing up and walking over to him, grabbing him from the shoulder and yanking him back. I saw that a grin was on his face, not unlike the one he wore when I was in control over him, but this time there was something very sick about it. I'm silencing this bitch, he said with some giggles. I looked over him and saw that he had taken a decent chunk of flesh out of her shoulder. Disgusted at him ruining my canvas, I beat him over the head with my cane, kicking him off the girl and quickly fusing some porcelain to her wound so that she wouldn't bleed out before I could still have some fun with her. Looking over at Travis, I raised my cane again to strike him, but he simply stood up and waited at the table, a blank look over his face as he stared at Liz on the table. Travis? I asked him, stepping closer and waving my hand in front of his button eyes, raising a brow at his inaction. I shrugged, however. He seemed domesticated enough, so I went about with my plans. The rest of Travis's story is true. I did smash Liz in front of him and leave him there. Although, there's a reason I believe he said it was all his fault. If you recall, after I had turned him into my very own puppet, he said he was losing his sanity. Why do you think he stopped bringing that up? Travis was held in my shop for a very long time and was not allowed to sleep. In fact, he still isn't allowed to sleep. So how does he say that he keeps falling asleep, I wonder? He doesn't, I'm afraid. I must admit this to you, all fair readers. It would seem Travis has developed a fun side to himself. Do you need more proof? I admit you must think of me as the least reliable source after all. I didn't kill Travis's mother. Quite a bold claim, huh? Travis breezed past his mother's warnings of rain, said that the last words were that he loved her. A sweet sentiment, of course. It didn't end that way. I... And my mother arrived just as Travis ran out of the house on a mission to God knows where. Probably some failed way of getting rid of me. Needless to say, he had broken down the door in his attempt to escape his own house. If he hadn't been in such a hurry to enter the house, he would have noticed that it was broken out of and not into. Stepping inside with my mother, it was obvious to see a struggle had broken out in the house. Making my way into the kitchen, I raised a brow as I found his mother's lifeless body on the floor. Now, there was something I was not expecting. You all thought that I had killed her? Have I had any reason to do so? She asked me for nothing. She had not harmed me before. Yes, I wanted to do it to punish Travis, but didn't say that I'd do it in front of him. Where's the fun in him arriving for her to be already dead? Kneeling over her head, I placed a hand on her and gave her some temporary life, trying to find out from her what had happened. Her eyes sprung to life and looked around the house frantically. I looked at her with a chuckle waiting for her to calm down and reveal what her last words were. Travis, it's so cold. So cold. It's so dark and cold outside. Put on a sweater. What are you doing? No! 
Those were the last words that she screamed at me. Now, that really brought my attention up. If Travis was the last person she talked to, and we had just seen Travis run out of my house, it doesn't take a detective to figure this one out now, does it? I brought the findings to my mother, and she confirmed my thoughts. Now, why would he kill his own mother? After saving them from you? She asked, handing me back the head, which had since fallen silent. I shrugged back at her and set the severed head back down. It didn't make much sense to me, but it did the more that I thought about it. Mama, is it bad that I refuse to allow Travis to sleep? I asked her as she was the one who had created the way to keep my body alive and my soul kept inside said body. She looked at me for a second and then to the head on the table. Charles, don't tell me you did that to the boy. You know very well what happens when a resurrected body is left to think for itself for so long. She sighed taking a seat on Travis's surprisingly nice furniture. I shrugged and looked away. I thought that he didn't need sleep, I explained. How was I supposed to know that Travis was going to end up growing an insane personality? Mother sighed and thought for a while before looking at me. We have to keep him alive a bit longer, son, she finally said. I know you want your revenge and you'll get that, my love. But for now, we need to make sure he doesn't screw with any Loa and undo everything I worked so very hard for. She said, standing up and wrapping her arms around me. Fine, but I at least get to use him in performance for you, I said with a smile to which I got a happy nod. So, we waited for Travis to come back for wherever it was that he was going. And when he did, he ended up lighting my pants on fire and booking it. Shame. He's a slippery salamander, and I admire that in him. So, you really think I'm lying? Fair enough. But let me ask you this. Why would I only cut off her head? Where's the fun and showmanship in that? Why didn't I turn her into a living voodoo doll? Or bring her back to life to attack him? A simple decapitation is simply too boring and unoriginal for me. King Creel takes pride in his work. This must be very hard for y'all to hear. And I understand that. You grown attached to him, like a puppy. But any feral or rabid dog must be put down, and I intend to do so. What's wrong with him? To the best I can piece together is that he blacks out and has this violent personality that takes over. It happens suddenly, just like when I cornered him in his house with Alexandra. After he had thrown me against the wall of his kitchen, he then turned to Alexandra, who confusingly looked at him, then let out a scream as he attacked her. He lurched towards her and nearly took a chunk out of her arm. Luckily, the woman was able to grab a pot and strike him in the head, sending him into my arms as he slipped into unconsciousness. Thank you, Alexandra. I always knew that You were a good girl, I said with a chuckle as I patted his head. She watched as I set him down and approached her. She lifted the pot to hit me next, but I raised my hand to show her that I meant no harm. Easy. I'll let you stay with Olivia, I chuckled. How on earth do you think I can believe that? She said with the pot still firmly held in her hands. Then I pointed down to the voodoo puppet at my feet. She hesitantly lowered the pot, but still put some distance between me and her. Let's just say that 
Little old Travis isn't right in the head currently, I said with a chuckle, pushing my hat up and brushing the bangs out of my buttons. Have you noticed that? I asked with a smile, looking down at the floor and putting my foot on his head to keep him down on the floor just in case. I thought it was just grief. She mumbled, stepping back and sitting down in one of the kitchen chairs, face in her hands as she let out an exhausted <sighs> sigh. He locked himself in the bathroom. First, I thought it was just crying, but then he started throwing and ripping things apart inside there. And, well, his mother's head certainly put some doubts in my mind. She said, rubbing her arm and avoiding the gaze from me. Figured as much. I'll take him off your hands, I said with a toothy grin. The feeling of the stitches in my mouth about to rip is a feeling that makes others worry, but it makes me want to smile more, just to see how far they'll go until they burst. Sorry for getting off track there. No, keep your hands off him, she declared, picking up the pot again and about to hit me, until little Miss Olivia came running and hugged me by the legs. I looked down at her and smiled as I rubbed her head. Don't hurt mommy. She shouted, gripping my leg tightly and refusing to let me go. Despite her mother's protest, she looked at me in defeat and lowered her weapon in defeat. Chuckling, I picked her up and balanced her against my hip. My knight in shining armor, I joked happily, tapping her on the nose and smiling at her as she giggled, wiping some tears from her eyes. Yes, Bringing back her old mother was a low blow, but it was the only way to get them out of the house and protect Olivia. See, I would never hurt a child. I will stop you and save Travis. Alexandra mumbled to me, coming over and snatching the girl from me, keeping her close and putting distance between me and her. I shrugged and grabbed Travis by the hair and started dragging him away. I'm sorry, Travis, she said sadly as I dragged him away. If I still had eyes, I would have rolled them. She cares far too much for him. I gave her a second chance to raise a child and now she wants another one. Give a mouse a cookie, huh? From my findings, it seems that Travis's murderous personality is quite the sadist. From just hanging up there on stage, I can examine his words and his actions. He can't do much swinging and hanging up there, but he certainly has a mouth on him. It's pretty easy to tell when it's Travis talking and when it's his more fun side talking. His more fun side has that voice on him under my control. Sir, will you let me down so I may have my fun? He asked me gnashing his teeth as the strings suspended him. He thrashes around and demands to be released. He wants to have fun. He clearly has some issues that he wants to let out. Tell me something, Travis, my boy, I asked, walking around him on stage, going over and sitting at my piano, playing some scales to ensure that I will never lose my skills. He grained his head to look at me, the stitches on his neck nearly breaking at the angle. How did you kill your mother? Oh, that's a fun story, sir, he said with a happy noise I can best describe as a squee. I smiled at that and continued to play, letting him relay the fun little details of the actions. I was on my way to some graveyard when my mama told me to put on a sweater since it was so cold and gonna rain or something like that. He shrugged the best that he could being suspended from strings on his arms and feet. And why did you do that? I asked, giving the keys a nice flourish to get the details out of him. Well, I went to the kitchen 
and she was there. And so I grabbed a big old kitchen knife. I grabbed her by the hair and drove the knife into her neck. She let out a scream, but I think the knife caused her to stop talking. So right after that, I grabbed the knife and just hacked away at her. He said with the giddiness of a naughty child, I rather enjoyed this side of Travis. My, and to think you believe that I would do something so crass and unsightly, I said with a chuckle, ending my little practice session and walked up to him, having the strings lower him so that I could meet him button to button. I saw that there was some kind of bloodlust that I first had when I had killed Henry and his thugs. It would seem that when you're first brought back to life and aren't properly taken care of, unexpected results can happen. Well, Mama never said her method was perfect. Now, I bet most of you still don't believe me, but I issue a challenge to all of you. Pay careful attention to the next upload. I'll give Travis his little cell phone and he'll be able to update y'all. If at any time you see that Travis seems to be suddenly in a different location, or talking to a person for a second, and then they're dead the next, you'll know I was right. Anyway, that's all from King Creole, folks. I look forward to seeing what little old Travis has cooked up for me. Don't believe a fucking word, he says. He's lying through those fucking stitches of his. I would never kill my own mother. He fucking did it. When he handed my phone back to me and informed me that he had added a new part to my log, I was worried to see where it was going to go, and to my shock and horror, it was worse than I ever imagined. He is lying through his fucking teeth. I swear he is. I even told him as much. And all he did was just laugh at me and issue me a challenge. As he said that the strings released me, and I collapsed to the stage with a hard thud. You think I'd lie to you, Travis, my boy? He tissed at me, approaching me and kneeling. Pushing my chin up with his finger, he smiled down at me and fixed my hair. How about this? I'll let you go for 24 hours. If you can't prove to me that you haven't lost your marbles, I'll let you go. Cross my heart, he said, pulling me up to my feet and dusting me off. What makes you think I won't just take this opportunity to run? And I spat at him, keeping my distance and making sure he didn't do anything funny with me. I knew his tricks. I knew how he thinks. And I know for a fact that he'll take any opportunity he can to hurt me. Because I've read your little conversation with the Baron, and I can safely say that no danger is going to come my way. <laughs> he chuckled, turning and walking away from me. Despite the strings no longer controlling me, I couldn't just lunge and rip him to shreds as badly as I wanted to. Not until he exited the auditorium was I finally able to move on my own. Rushing after him and throwing the doors open, I was met with the charred remains of the voodoo store once again. Looking back in pure confusion, then looking back at the door, which was now the basement door, I rubbed my head in confusion. Shaking that out of my head and making my way out of the burned down remains, a sign attached to the outside frame of the door to the shop was predominantly displayed. It read, coming soon, the grand reopening of Old King Creels. I grabbed the sign and ripped it from its place. No way will I let him reopen the shop, not after what he did to me. Running off towards my house, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Seeing my house was still abandoned and theorized that Alexandra and Olivia were back at their home, I entered the house and changed into my normal clothes tossing the suit off that I was forced to wear at the wall of my room and sitting down to think. He's lying, I mumbled to myself. There's no way in hell that I did that to my own mother. 
Heading back down to the living room, I went to the spot where my mother had been lying. Well, where her body was at least. I closed my eyes and I tried to think. I know I said goodbye to her and left the house, right? I did say that. I, I know I did. My buttons scanned the room for the murder weapon that Creel said that I had used. A kitchen knife. Not finding one, I chuckled. My first proof that he was lying. That was... Until I took a step forward and suddenly found myself bent under the fridge. How the hell did I get there? Looking around confused, I soon found the reason why I was lying on the floor reaching underneath the fridge. It was because I was pulling out a bloody kitchen knife. Staring at it in horror, I quickly tossed it away and backed away from it, grabbing my hair and shaking quickly. No. No, that didn't make any sense. He planted it there. It was obvious that he did. He's just trying to fuck with me. Reaching out for the knife again, I took it into my hands and looked at it, and the blade was bent. I didn't do this. I mumbled to myself, dropping the knife and looking back to where my mother had been sitting. I had seen her, and I had told her that I loved her. I had. I had. Shaking my head, I quickly stood and rushed to the dried blood stain on the floor and looked around for my mother's body, but most likely Creel had his cop buddies remove it after he took me. Reaching for my phone, I quickly dialed my dad, hoping that he would pick up. Travis, I've been worried sick about you. He quickly shouted at me, sending my stress levels down just hearing his usual voice. Letting out a cathartic breath, I sat down on one of the couches and just let him scold me for a bit. Dad, how bad was mom's body? I asked, interrupting his lecture. There was a long period of silence as... He was obviously caught off guard by the question. He and my mom were high school sweethearts. They'd known each other their whole lives, and I knew that he was hurting just as bad as I was. Bad. Real bad. Her neck was... jagged. Like he had just hacked away at her with a kitchen knife, like it was a dull axe. He mumbled to me. And that gave me some hope. Creel was decapitated with a dull saw. Did he do the same to my mother in revenge? Did you find the knife? I asked him, looking back at the kitchen and seeing the knife was still where I had left it. No. There's nowhere to be found. Where are you, son? I don't want to lose you like I had lost her. My dad said, obviously choking back tears. Rubbing my face, I took at the spot where Creel had been drinking coffee next to my mother's head. I'm at home. Where are you? I finally answered, giving my dad time to get his emotions in check. I had warned him to get out of town when he had found my mom's body. I was hoping that he had heeded my warning. I'm at a hotel, just outside of town near the freeway, he explained. I nodded as he gave me the details I said that I would be there soon, hanging up with a I love you. I sighed and I started on my way, past the destroyed door and took a look at the pieces of it. It was broken out of, not into. Swallowing a lump in my throat, my next destination was Alexandra's house. Pulling my hood up over my face, I made my way there. It took me a bit to get there on foot, but when I arrived, I knocked on her door, noticing the hole in the window was still there. The door cautiously opened as Alexandra looked at me and hesitated to open it all the way. Travis, she said in a shocked gasp looking around for me, opening the door all the way. Did you escape? She asked me, letting me enter the house, but she kept a good distance between the two of us. I thought it was for her betrayal of me. It had to be for that. Right. No. <laughs> he let me go. So I could prove that I'm not the one who killed my mom, I explained, walking past her and looking around the house. She avoided eye contact with me when I looked back at her and started to get worried. You don't think that I did that, do you? I asked. My heart broke when I tried to approach her and she backed away further away from me. I don't know. Travis? How long has it been since you've last slept? She asked me, concern plastered all over her face. I looked at her like she just insulted my mother. She wasn't on his side too, was she? Last night, when I was being suspended by the strings again, 
I told her, crossing my arms and staring at her in a defensive manner, and her face grew paler as a result. I didn't know it could since she was about as pale as I was. Travis, you couldn't sleep when connected to the strings, remember? At the shop, you were never allowed to sleep. She told me, and my stomach dropped as I lost my balance and backed into the wall behind me. She had a point. So? Ever since I escaped, I've been able to sleep? I shot back at her, pushing off from the wall and pointing at her, sending her cowering back and backing up behind into the living room as I followed after her. Travis, when you were in my bathroom... After your mother's head was thrown in there, what did you do? She asked me, shaking. I stared at her for a good long while, my butt and eyes trailing to the bathroom. Walking in that direction, I opened the door and stared at the sight before me. The entire room was a mess. Things broken and thrown in random directions. All I remember was trying to cry in here. I, I, I didn't do this. You're trying to set me up. You hit me in the back of the head and turned me over to him. I shouted in anger, taking a shard of broken glass from the bathroom mirror and pointing it at her. She threw her hands in the air and backed up further away from me. No, you attacked me. Y you tried to attack me and yelled awful, awful things at me. She whimpered, truly terrified of me. I looked down at my hand and stared at the shard of glass that I was threatening her with. What was I doing? I dropped it and I walked off towards the door. Tell Olivia to take care of Tempe for me. He makes a better doll than her old mother, I said as I exited the home, tuning out the words Alexandra said back to me. Pulling my hood back up on, I stuck my hands in my pockets and walked off in no particular direction. I didn't kill my mom. He's fucking lying. He's wrong. I, I love her. I would have never done that to her. My aimless wandering suddenly had me walking right into the gate of the old cemetery. I looked around in complete confusion. How the hell had I gotten here? I went in the complete opposite direction of this place, and this place had a good hour's walk from Alexandra's house. Pulling out my phone, I stared at it in disbelief. It was an hour's walk, because it had been an hour since I last checked the time. No. No, 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 no. I stammered, stepping away from the cemetery and staring at the rusted and overgrown door. Creel's words to you guys echoed in my head like a gong. Watch out for when I black out. I shook my head so hard I thought that the stitches holding it on would bust and my head would go rolling. The hell's the matter with you, son? A familiar nasally voice asked me, causing me to look to my side and see none other than the Baron. Shovel slung over his shoulder and staring at me like I was some freak show attraction. He was chewing on one of my dad's cigars. I quickly stumbled over to him and looked up at him. What's happening to me? What did that psycho and his mother do to me? I begged him. He chuckled with a grin as he took the cigar out of his mouth and tapped it over me like I was an ashtray. You shouldn't play with a life and death, son. Only a professional can do that, right? Creel's mother is one, so he got off mostly scot-free. Him, on the other hand, his work is downright shitty, he said to me, setting his shovels down and looking at me as he puffed away on the scar that I had given him. I would love nothing more than to tie up all his loose ends, but Mama Creel and I have an understanding. I can always tie up your loose end, of course, he said with a chuckle. I looked at him, confused by what he meant. I don't have any loose ends. I've never brought back anyone from the dead before. That got a genuine cackle out of the Baron. He slapped his leg as he let out a howl of laughter, looking at me like I had said the funniest shit in the world. But you are a loose end, son. Why do you think I offered to help you? Getting rid of Creel helps get rid of you. Before you get too comfortable with your little murders, he chuckled. I saw into those buttons of yours. I saw something bad ruining them. So I offered you the best way to beat him. Though it seems like 
you're running out of time in that regard, he said, leaning down to pick up his tools as I stared at him in horror. I haven't killed anyone, I shouted at him, and he looked at me with a raised brow as he blew smoke from his nose, taking the scar out of his mouth again and tapping the ash off. Sure about that? You certainly did a number on your own mother, he said with a smile, pushing the door to the cemetery open and entering it, shutting it closed behind him as I stared at the spot where he had been. I wrapped my arms around myself and I felt the floor as I rocked back and forth. No. No. He's wrong. He's fucking wrong. And I cried, looking back at the cemetery and banging on its door. Do you hear me? I didn't kill her. I screamed, smashing my fists into the rusty door and clawing at it. Shoving myself away from it, I walked off in no particular direction. I pulled up my phone and texted my dad to come to pick me up. As I waited at the spot that we had determined, I stared down at my hands covered in the door's rust. Don't really think that I have to worry about tetanus as a voodoo puppet. As I sat at the park bench and waited for my dad, I did my hardest to try to remember back to when I had left the house. I clearly remember walking down the stairs, walking past my mother, and saying I loved her, and being on my way to the graveyard. There's no way that I could have done that. Hey, Travis! My dad's voice shouted at me. Looking up, I saw that he was already here. I raised a brow at that. How the hell had I not heard him? I shrugged and I just entered the car and sighed as I sat there. Finally, thought I was going to have to honk after you, he sighed, putting the car in drive and driving us both towards the highway. Dad, I finally spoke up after a while and a good length of time. My dad looked at me for a second and then back at the road, his signal that I had his attention. Have I... Have I been sleeping? I asked him. He raised a brow at that question and shrugged. Shouldn't you be the one who knows that? He asked me, pulling into the exit to the hotel. I sighed and shook my head, letting the conversation die right there. Thankfully, we could skip the lobby since my dad already had booked two single beds. In case I finally showed up in the need of rest. Taking me up to his room, I looked around at the stereotypical hotel room. Entering the bathroom, I closed the door behind myself and again let out a long and sad sigh as I sat on the toilet and put my face in my hands. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. I did not kill her. Creel's deadline loomed large in my mind as I washed my hands of the rust still on them. Some of it had gone underneath my fingernails, so I scrubbed and picked at them to get my nails decently clean. Except, on closer inspection... It wasn't rust. It was dried blood. Backing up from the sink, I stumbled and fell into the bathtub. Taking the shower curtain with me, I sat in complete shock. Standing up, I quickly shut off the water and walked out there. You okay? My dad asked, concern plastered on his face. I assured him that I was perfectly fine. Just slipped and tumbled into the shower. He and I laughed it off and we sat to watch the hotel's crappy TV. I sat and I watched it in awkward silence as I fidgeted with my fingers. Where had all this blood underneath my nails come from? Dad, I finally spoke up, clearing my throat again and waking him up from his slumber. He had a habit of falling asleep whenever the TV was on. He snorted awake and looked at me. I'm going to go get some fresh air, I said. He gave me a nod and handed me the room key. Walking out of the room, I put my hood up and mumbled to myself as I walked along the halls of the hotel. As I wandered around, I found myself heading outside to my dad's car, unlocking it, and climbing into the passenger seat, and opening the glove box. Aside from all the paperwork and random crap in there, I found the item that I wanted. My dad, along with being a smoker and a drinker, was also a hunter. Inside the glove box was a hunting knife. Taking the item and hiding it in my hoodie pocket, I closed the car door and locked it. I once again entered the hotel and made my way back up to our room. Unlocking it and entering it, I found my dad asleep again on the bed. 
I didn't kill her. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't grab her by her hair and stab her in the neck. Then while she was on the floor, hacked away at her throat with the knife until her head fell off her shoulders. Taking the knife out of my pocket, I pulled it from its sheath and dropped the sheath to the floor. Climbing on top of my dad, he jerked himself awake and stared at me in horror as I drove the knife into his torso. He didn't get to scream much after I slit his throat. Just like you showed me, dad. <laughs> I chuckled as I gutted him like the animals that he had me gut when he took me hunting when I was young. Giggled loudly as I stabbed and stabbed him. I had more time to have fun with him than I did my mom. So I made sure to show everybody all my hard work. Some guts over here, his head on the TV. Oh, I had so much fun. I killed her. I killed him. Maybe now King Creel will say what a good boy I am now. What happened? I didn't kill her. My dad is dead. Why? I didn't do this. I went for a walk. And now I found him dead? No, 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 no. Yes. Yes, I did. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. A cleaning lady found me with my dad's corpse a couple of hours after I had my fun with him. After I murdered him. I could have killed her. What little conscience I had I left stopped me from doing it. I didn't say a word to the police as they slapped the cuffs on me and shoved me out of the bloodied hotel room. I was silent again as they roughly shoved me into the police cruiser and when they began driving me off towards the station. Better call that voodoo freak. Got a lot of explaining to do on this one, the cop driving said. Driving me towards the station, I looked at them from behind the cage that separated me from them. I pushed my face close to the cage and tried to listen to their conversation. It's getting harder to do whatever he says, especially after that whole shop burned down. He's got us tuned up to 11 covering for all his shit, the man mumbled, sighing as he stopped at a red light and looked back at me, flinching when he saw how close I was staring at him. He soon elbowed the cage hard and sent me back into my seat. Rubbing my nose, I stared in silence as they continued driving after the red light. A hey, uh, isn't that the clerk? Or cashier? Whatever? The other cop asked, turning to look at me with the disgusted look. I stared back at him with my button eyes and just stared at him, eventually winning as he turned and looked straight ahead. How should I know? The freak never informs us of nothing, the lead cop said, driving off towards the station. He looked at me through the rearview mirror and kept a watchful eye on me the whole drive there, then making sure to keep quiet about King Creel around me. I sighed as we finally arrived at the station, and I was pulled out of the back seat and into the station. Having all these cops eye me as I was pushed into a solo cell was uncomfortable, to say the least. I sat down on the cold bench of the holding cell and stared at the ceiling light as I took in the gravity of the situation of what I had done. And I killed my mother. And I killed my father. And while inside I was tearing myself with grief. But aside from some thoughts of that, I didn't feel anything other than a sense of pride. At least with my dad's death, I was able to have more fun with it. A freak, the cop who brought me here had said, banging on the bars with his nightstick, bringing my attention from the ceiling over to him. I stared at him for a while. I would normally answer him, but I really didn't have anything I wanted to tell him. The boss is here, he snuffed, stepping aside as a familiar face and a top hat came into my view. 
I sat up straighter when he did and stood up all the way when he came to the stop in front of my cell. Travis, you've been a very naughty boy. He tissed at me, looking at me in the cell and looking at the bars, tapping the metal rod with his cane with that smile of his. I looked at him and then looked at the floor in disgrace. I'm sorry, sir, I said on my own volition. The first words that I had spoken ever since carving my father up into pieces. He seemingly relished in those words and stared at me through those bars. He was eating up the sight of me no longer trying to fight him. I heard from this nice officer that you made a very big mess in a hotel room. He said with a chuckle and the cop rolled his eyes. He did more than make a mess. The sack of yours completely destroyed his dad like he was a fucking fish. He shot at Creel, grabbing him by the back of the collar and pulling the voodoo king back from my cell. I swallowed hard as I backed away from what I was dreading was about to happen. Son, I'll ask you kindly to let go of me, Creel said, clearly annoyed at this officer for laying a hand on him. The officer, however, clearly didn't take the hint pulling him away from me and shoving him into looking at me. Your little deal with the department is quickly showing itself to be lopsided and in your favor. The only crime that gets committed here is by you. He shoved his finger into Creel's chest. He looked down at it and then up at the officer's face, sighing as he grabbed the man's hand and yanked it right out of its wrist. It was like his hand was a glove and it had been completely and easily ripped off. He stared in disbelief for a moment and then began screaming as blood began spilling out of his stump. Creel didn't give him long to anguish as he quickly shoved the man away and grabbed his ring of keys as he tumbled down and fell to the floor with a loud thud. Dead from, I assume, shock. Fast-acting shock. Seems like you don't have a family anymore, Travis, he said with a hum, opening up my cell and walking in dropping the keys and tapping his cane on the cold stone floors. I looked at the floor in disgrace once again and as he approached and gripped me by the shoulders. I... I... I don't. I said with a soft mumble. He looked at me with a smile and pushed my chin up to meet his button eyes. My time's up. Isn't it? I asked him, to which he nodded with a wide smile and a tussle of my hair. Great so... Not like you have anywhere to go anyway. And I need my clerk back for the grand reopening. He patted me on the head and turned to leave, waiting at the door for me. I looked at him and then the cage that I was being forced to choose between. An eternity of prison with him, or an eternity of prison behind bars. Reluctantly, I chose him, walking over to him and keeping my head down as he led me out of the station. Creel! An old grumbly voice came, causing him to stop and turn to look at who the owner of the voice was. I followed suit, seeing an elderly cop with a white mustache and a receding hairline coming over to us. Creel gave a slight giggle as he waved to the man. Captain! How are you, sir? Is there something that I can help you with? Creel asked him, leaning into his cane with a smile as he waited for an answer. The man stopped in his tracks when he laid eyes on Creel. He gulped and any courage he seemingly had was quickly wiped away. Um, you, you killed another officer. Did, did he give you some, some, some kind of trouble? The man asked, clearly on the defensive as Creel seemingly had some kind of sway over him. Creel tapped his chin and thought as if the fact that he had killed a police officer had completely slipped his mind. Oh, yes. He was very rude to me and my employee. Saying things like our deal with each other was only benefiting me. Can you believe such nonsense? Creo cackled, slapping me on the back as he laughed. I stumbled forward a bit and offered my boss a little courtesy chuckle as well. The captain, meanwhile, was seemingly about to faint at how badly he was sweating. We... We would, we would never think that, sir, the captain quickly assured, swallowing hard and leading us over to the front desk, pulling out my record and handing it over to Creel. He marveled at it and handed it to me to look. 
looking at my old self was like looking at a complete stranger. I didn't know who the person looking back at me was, and I don't think that he even knows who I am. Thank you very much for your help, Captain. Creel tipped his hat and led me out of the police station. Once we were outside, he yanked the sheet from me and tore it up into pieces in front of me. Another piece of me destroyed and I was left with just him now. What happens now, sir? I asked timidly. He looked at me with a raised brow and chuckled like I was an idiot. And maybe I was. We go back to the shop, of course. After all, you and Mama need to learn to get along. Plus, your punishment is still not over. Just because you killed your daddy doesn't mean you get rid of what you did. He hummed, grabbing me by the hair and pulling me close, shoving the head of the cane into my face. Besides, I'd like to meet this new Travis, the one who wants me to call him a, a good boy, he mused. I swallowed hard, forgetting that I had written that during the murder of my dad. I kept silent which didn't make Creel happy as his smile wavered, and he beat me over the head with his cane. He grabbed me by the hair and dragged me off as he forced me to walk off towards the end of the town where the shop had been located. I received several strikes and hits from him when I finally arrived at the shop, seeing that it was nearly complete. Amazing what a couple of hands can do, isn't it? He asked with a chuckle as he leaned on my shoulder and waved his hand at everything that had been done to fix the once burnt down voodoo shop. It was like visiting the site of a horrible accident that had scarred you for life, and I was forced to be back here once again. Yes, sir. Amazing. I answered back to him submissively. He smiled and ushered me into the shop. It was pretty much exactly the same. Down to the dusty counter and the wall of voodoo dolls. No telling where all those had come from. My main guess was that they were all the old ones, just shoved back into the voodoo doll. Is that you, Charles? A voice came from the office. Creel's mother had poked her head out of there, and upon seeing me, she instantly stared daggers at me and exited from the office, a voodoo doll in her hands as she continued to sew. Seems she taught Creel that as well. Why on earth did you bring him back here? She snuffed, obviously not liking me and I shared the sentiment. He's my pet, mama. Besides, who else is going to be the clerk? He slapped me on the back, sending me stumbling into the strings which had been dangling from the ceiling seemingly waiting for my inevitable return. This time, I didn't bother fighting it. What was even the point? I had nothing left that I was willing to fight for. He'll bring us nothing but trouble, Charles. Mama Creel scolded, coming over to me and grabbing my face roughly, digging her nails into my cheeks and examining every inch of my face. Apparently, she didn't like what she saw, since she pulled away with a disgusted look on her face. He is defective, she declared. Well, I already knew that, Creel said with a chuckle, coming over to his mother's side and looking at me like I was a display sign. He smiled his stupid little smile as he looked at me, seemingly waiting for me to do something, and that something was brought to him when the door behind me opened and a familiar chime of the bell rang. I spun on my heels and looked at the person who had suddenly come into the shop. She was a teenager, probably just starting her senior year. She visibly recoiled when she saw me, and I didn't make the situation better by stepping forward to her causing her to back up and seemingly try to find the door to get the hell out of there. Welcome, I sang, on my own without any sort of string influence. She looked at me with a good amount of fear and confusion in her eyes. Unfortunately, we're still not open yet. If you like, I can keep your order on hold until our grand reopening, I said with a smile as she looked around the shop and then looked back at the sign seeing clearly that we weren't open yet. Uh, no. I was just looking for a job. She asked, handing me a flyer. I stared at the flyer, grabbing it and looking over to Creel with anger in my buttons. He waved at me with a chuckle. He was trying to replace me. He was trying to get rid of me. 
I crumpled up the flyer and turned back to look at the girl with a big smile. Ah, I see. Come, right this way, I said, taking her past Creel and his mother. We both said nothing as they watched me with interest. I led the girl over to the counter and bent down behind it, smiling to myself when I found exactly what I was looking for. I reached out and grabbed a pair of scissors, reappearing from behind the counter. I stabbed her hand into the counter with a hard smash. She screamed loudly as she looked at the scissors sticking out of her hand. She pulled on them, trying to get away, but I smiled as I watched her struggle and try to get away from me. She was so pathetic, even trying to pry her hand off the counter. I grabbed her by the hair and stared into her terrified eyes. The old me would have been terrified to see what I was doing to this poor girl. But she was after my job. And this is all I had in the end. Isn't it? You fucking freak, let go of me. She screamed and begged, trying with all her frail might to pull herself free. Well, I certainly helped her, of course. I pulled the scissors out of her hand and drove it into her temple. That certainly shut that naughty mouth of hers right up. <laughs> she flopped to the floor in silence as she finally shut the fuck up. I looked over to Creel for any kind of praise. He smiled at me and clapped happily. His mother was still staring with disapproval at me. There is still no pleasing that woman. Creel walked over to me and looked at the body that was wriggling on the floor. He smiled with a sense of pride as he looked at me. You're a good boy, he said with a coup, as if finally giving me something that he was holding out for for so long. And I offered him another smile back, but that was quickly wiped off my face when he raised a hand and slapped me across the face, sending me spiraling into the wall next to me. I held my cheek and I looked at him in terror. But I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a good boy, I whimpered out pathetically. He looked over the counter at me with a raised brow and chuckled happily, coming over from behind the counter and grabbing me by my bloodied hoodie. He stared into my button eyes and I shuddered back. So, you still must be punished for your past sins. Nobody goes unpunished, Travis. Nobody he said softly, patting me on the spot where he had smacked me, before gut-punching me and causing me to dry heave. No telling when the last I ate was. You're my new Mary, he said with a yellow toothy grin. Except, you're more useful than that whore was, he chuckled, pulling me to my feet by the strings and forcing me to stand in place. Charles... Stop playing with your defective pet and get rid of that body. No point in letting precious materials go to waste. Mama Creel spoke, to which Charles nodded and walked over to the dead girl, grabbing her by the legs and pulling her away towards the basement. I guess business was starting back up again, after all. Once again, Creel was down in the basement, Mama Creel walking over to me and got a good look at me touching my face before finally letting out a long, exasperated sigh. Suddenly, she looked a lot older than she normally looked. Not like when she was a rotting corpse, but old enough to bring my attention to it. It looks like you were right. He's not the same son I once had. She sighed, looking towards her basement, the trail of blood soon disappearing as we looked at it. All those years without me must have corrupted him just like your lack of sleep has done to you. She sighed, rubbing her face into her hands and just shaking her head. W why D Does Baron Samadhi have a deal with you? I gathered the courage to ask, expecting to be hit or something by the woman, but she just looked at me with a sad chuckle. It's a very long story. A mother in sheer grief begging Aloha to save her baby boy. I wouldn't expect you to understand. She scoffed, turning to me, and stared again with her disapproving eyes. I said nothing to her as she went off and entered the office. 
I stayed at my counter until King Creole returned, happily singing to himself as he walked past me, and over to the front door and turning the closed sign to open. Travis, my boy, I do believe it's time for our grand reopening, he exclaimed with glee, clapping his hands and practically jumping up and down with excitement. He really was like a giant child whenever he got excited, but when he was angry, it was like a demon itself was hitting me, over and over again. Sir, should I change? I said, looking down at my bloody clothes. He looked over at me and smacked his forehead. He'd completely forgotten. He came walking over to me and took me by the shoulder, nodding and pointing to the basement door. I nodded obediently and walked over to the basement door. Opening it up, I was soon kicked in the back and sent tumbling all the way down to the bottom. Creo's cackling followed me down all the way to the basement. I pushed myself up and looked around, finding a clean change of clothes on the table before me. Changing back into my suit, I made my way back up to the top floor. I was worried that I would be locked down there like Mary, but the door was open and Creel was standing there waiting for me, a smile on his face as he stepped out of my way so I could take my place at the counter. I sighed as I stood behind it, staring at the empty spot where Tempe once was. I really was all alone this time. All my plans crumbled around me. And now I'm stuck here. Welcome back to Old King Creels, everyone. I do hope you'll stay a while. Please. Stay. Taking King Creel's blows on my back, I curled up into a ball and just accepted that he was going to beat me until he finally got bored. It took a long time, and in the end only a phone ringing from his office tore his attention from me. He looked over to his office and then down to me. Sighing, annoyed, he kicked me hard with his dress shoe and turned to enter his office. I sat there and slowly managed to pull myself up onto the counter. I gasped to try to catch my breath, finally getting my bearings and looking up to see Mama Creel staring at me with a silver platter with a coffee pot and a fancy looking coffee cup. I looked at her in confusion. Was she offering me a cup of coffee? She just looked at me in disgust and shoved the tray into my hands. I caught it quickly, looking down at all the items clanging around. Great. Now I'm his butler. Why didn't I go to college? Sighing and nodding obediently and walking over towards his office. Knocking softly, I pushed my way into his office and stared at him as he talked to someone through a rotary phone. Monsieur Leblanc. Comment allez-vous? Oui, oui. Tout va bien ainsi. J'espère que vous êtes votre petit informat als bien. He said with a genuine chuckle. I stared confused at Creel never having heard him speak French once the entire time of knowing him. Not only was he a good speaker, it sounded like he always had spoken that language. Keeping my head down, I walked over to him and sat his cup down, softly pouring some of the black coffee into a cup. Grabbing me by the shoulder, he shoved me out of the way once that it was enough. Quel? Non juste ma stupide marionnette. Sinclair. Qu'est-ce que tu pas entendu parler de l'eau de poids des mois? He mumbled into the phone, shooing me away with his hand and forcing me out of the office as he grabbed the cup that I had poured for me and took a sip as he nodded to the receiver phone. Sighing once again, I was out of the office. I returned to my position at the counter as I looked down at its endless dust. So, you met the Baron. Creole's mother asked me as she sat in a rocking chair making a voodoo doll. She sewed the little doll without even looking. She just stared at me as she did so. I looked at her and then to the office, saying nothing as I nodded to her. She nodded and sighed as she finally looked down at her doll. When Charles died, I acted out of anger and sheer grief and agreed that if I supplied him with as many bodies as he wanted, 
He would never allow my son to die again. She said with a sigh, rubbing the doll's little head and closing her eyes. He told me how to stop him. I mumbled softly, keeping my voice down to hide it from Creel. She looked back up at me with that smile that all mothers have, the one where she has pride over a child. Chuckling, she set the doll down on my counter. Bury him, I know. That's how Samdi takes us to the afterlife. Because Creole is undead and has never been buried, I was able to put his soul back into his body. As long as he never goes into the ground, he'll never die. She explained to me, looking at the little doll that she had made in seemingly no time at all. It would also be how to put me back to rest. I looked at the woman who I had since first accidentally brought back to life by accident. She was informing me about how to beat her and her son. But why? She was his mother after all. She seemingly read my mind and stood up to come over to me and to take me softly by the shoulders. I shivered, expecting a hit from her, but she instead wrapped her arms around me. I've made mistakes. And seeing what Charles has done with his second chance of life really has opened my eyes to my mistakes. She sighed, letting me go and fixing my hair like any mother does when she sees something out of place. Well, you help me. I whimpered to her, submissively looking down at the floor, expecting to be hit or hurt for even asking her for help but she pushed up my chin to be able to look at her. Her motherly eyes looked down at me like I was a little lost, abused puppy. Our little chat was interrupted by Creel, who slammed the door to get our attention. We both looked over and stared at him as he watched the scene with a raised brow, walking over with his cane in his hands. Mama, what are you doing with my puppet? He asked, coming over to me and tapping his cane on the floor causing me to stand up straight and rigid. Walking over to him, I stared at him in terror as he raised the cane up to scare me. Luckily, he was interrupted by the front door opening, and a small child running in and wrapping her arms around him. Mr. King Creel! Olivia hummed as she hugged him. His tone instantly changed as he turned to look at her with a bright smile, picking her up and smiling at her. Olivia, my... Why isn't it a surprise to see you here? He hummed as he sat her on the counter. I stared at her and then looked over at the door to see Alexandra standing there, too ashamed to look at me as she walked into the shop. She looked over to Mama Creel and bowed her head in respect to the old woman. What are y'all doing here anyway? He asked Olivia, the little girl looking up at him with her innocent little eyes. She then pointed over to the door. Following her fingers, he saw that she was pointing at Alexandra, who moved out of the way and revealed Sophie crawling into the shop and staring up at Creel. She was looking worse, her human half rotting and her doll half half leaking stuffing. You! She snarled, pouncing up with speed and velocity enough to tackle Creel and sending him over the counter as she attacked him. Creel let out a growl as he was tackled and attacked. His mother quickly rushed behind the counter to help him. I stared in awe at it, and with a quick snipping sound, I saw that Alexandra had rushed over and cut the strings holding me. She grabbed me by the tie and rushed out of the store. Olivia followed us after apologizing to Creel over and over as we ran. I looked back out of the shop as it went out of view. I looked over then to Alexandra, swallowing the bile building up in my throat. Why? Why are you helping me? What if I try to kill you? I asked her, and she scoffed and smiled at me. You'll have to try very hard for that, Travis. She said with a smile. Taking my hand, she led me a while while carrying Olivia in her other arm. We arrived at the cemetery gates and entered them. Looking around at the overgrown graves, we looked out for the Baron. Olivia, who was now out of her mother's arms, tugged on my dress pants. I looked down at her and got to her level, and she greeted me with Tempe in her hands. The little voodoo doll reached out and grabbed my face, 
holding on to me as I pulled away. He clung to me and refused to let go. I gave him a soft smile as I pulled him off and held him in my hands. He clung to my fingers then and he seemingly refused to be separated from me. I missed you too, little guy. I chuckled. Olivia, hand me the purse, baby girl. Olivia asked. Olivia nodded happily and ran over to the gate and grabbed the bag. Bringing it to her mother, she smiled and received a head pat for her efforts. Fishing through the bag, Alexandra picked up a bottle of rum. Thank you, Sophie. She sighed, holding the bottle up and shaking it. Seemingly instantly, a hand reached out and grabbed the bottle. The Baron appeared from the grave beneath her. He grabbed it and pulled himself up with some grunts, patting the dirt off of him and looked down lovingly to the bottle before looking over to me with a raised brow and a scoff. You look like that asshole, he chuckled, putting the neck of the bottle to his mouth and biting it off, spitting the top of the bottle away and swinging the rum like it was water, letting out a satisfied groan as he pounded his chest with his hand. I looked at the floor to avoid his judgmental gaze. We humbly request your assistance, Baron Somdi, Alexandra said, causing the tall black man to look at her with a raised brow as he took a good long swig of the rum. Finally finishing his pull of the bottle, he looked at her with an interested gaze. You're with him? He asked, pointing over to me. She responded with a nod. He nodded and understood that we were all working against Creel. He took another swig and looked off towards the gate, pointing his finger over to the door and chuckling. He's right outside. Whatever you're gonna do, better do it quickly, he said with a soft giggle going back into his hole with his bottle of rum. Great help, I mumbled, softly rubbing Tempe's head with my thumb as I looked over to the gate. Indeed, the gate was thrown open as Creel and his mother entered it. In Creel's hand was what appeared to be left of Sophie. Body mangled beyond recognition, he tossed it to us and caused Olivia to run into Alexandra and hid behind her mother. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I've got all of you right where I want you, he chuckled, walking over and stepping over the corpse of Sophie. Walking over to us as his mother stayed by the gate entrance, looking around the graveyard she had been buried in. Travis, my boy, you want to prove to me that you're a good boy, don't you? He asked me, tilting his head as he looked at me. I stared back at him. He was right. I just wanted to show him that I was a good boy and didn't want to be punished anymore. How could I be a good boy? Maybe if I kill Alexandra, she's been such a problem to him ever since he's been giving her that second chance of being a mother. I... I began, but something pulled me back from that chain of thought. I looked down at Tempe as he pulled on my fingers. I looked down at him and he vigorously shook his head at me. Seeing him, I was able to pull myself back from the brink and stare at the creature that had been abusing me and hurting me all this time. The creature that had caused me to kill my own parents and help him murder countless others. Go. Fuck yourself, Charles. I said angrily. He tilted his head at me like I had just spoken in some unknown language to him. He put his hand to his ear and cocked it towards me. Did I hear that correctly? Guess I'll have to beat some sense into you, he said with a giggle, coming over to me only for his mother to grab him by the shoulder. He looked back at her confused. Charles, leave him. You can always create a different puppet. She pointed out to him, and he looked to her like she had stabbed him. He shoved off her hand and stared at her in complete disbelief. What? He asked, staring at her and gritting his yellow teeth. You think I'm going to just let him go? After all the shit that he has done to me? He screamed, his mouth wide open and snapping a good many of his stitches. His mother tried to calm him down, but... He simply shoved her off of him. Charles, I always taught you never to be selfish. Just let him go. 
The poor boy has suffered enough. She begged, pushing her son back and pointing an accusing finger at him. The voodoo king stared back at me and then to his mother. You brought me back to life. That was selfish. You kept me alive. That was selfish. You do not get to tell me never to be selfish. He shouted, turning to me and pointing. He will belong to me forever. He growled, grabbing his cane and coming over to me. I had backed up and had a gravestone between me and him. He came over to me and stepped on the grave, and I smiled at him. Watch your step, Charles, I said, pointing down to the grave as he came towards me. He stopped and had time to read the gravestone before he looked up at me in anger. His mother's grave, which she dug herself out of. He didn't have much time to react as the soft earth gave way, and he tumbled down into the grave. He clambered his way up and began to pull himself up, but something seemingly began to drag him back down into the grave. He looked back in shock at what he saw. Baron Samadhi pulling himself up to his level and smiling down at him, his black skin melting off his body until nothing but a skeleton smiled back at Creel. Time's up, Giles boy. Looks like I finally get to drag your sorry ass down here with me he declared, sinking back into the grave as Creel dug his fingers into the dirt to try to pull himself up. He looked around frantically for his mother, but when their eyes made contact, she simply looked away, leaving Creel as several skeleton hands rose up from the grave to start pulling him down into the grave. You think that this is over, Travis? Just cause I'll be gone... Won't mean a thing. You hear me? You don't go unpunished for what you've done. He screamed as he began to lose grip on the dirt and the grass. The skeletal hands pulled him down into the grave, refusing to let him up. I'll see you in hell, I said, looking down at him as he was pulled further into the grave by the hands. He left me with one final smile as the dirt consumed him, and the last thing left of Charles Sumner, a.k.a. King Creel, was his top hat once he was dragged underneath the dirt. I stared at the grave, seemingly waiting for him to burst back from the grave. But he didn't. So, ninety-five years erased, just like that. Mama Creel spoke up, bringing my attention over to her as she walked over to her own grave. She stood a good distance away from it, so she wouldn't immediately be dragged back down under as well. He's right. I was being selfish when I brought him back and made him immortal. But I don't know any mother who wouldn't do that for their child. She said, looking over to Alexandra, who was holding on to Olivia. Is he... really gone? I asked her. She looked up at me and offered me no answer to me. Just a simple smile as she approached the grave she had occupied. Her body seemingly returning to its rotten form as she was more gingerly sucked back into the grave, closing her eyes and accepting her fate. After so long, it was over. I looked over at Alexandra and Olivia, who looked at me with some sense of fear. But when I came over to them, they offered me hugs and held me as I cried hard into them. Temping clung to my hands as he comforted me as well. With my parents dead and no immediate family to take me in, I returned to their home. Despite my hopes and prayers, I remained the same. My body did not change back. I did not get my eyes back. I did not become who I used to be. I was cursed to remain a voodoo puppet. I spent a lot of time in my new room that Alexandra had given me. It was originally a guest room, but she left it to me to do what I wanted. I brought many of my old items from home and brought them there. Olivia was happy to have an older brother. At night when they slept, I stayed awake, staring out of my window, expecting him to be there, expecting him to have found a way to claw out of hell and take me down with him. But he didn't. And somehow I felt abandoned, like I had been used and dumped after all my uses had been extinguished. 
It was hard to adjust to life with Alexandra and Olivia. Alexandra wasn't a mother to me, and I was no son to her. It was like they brought me in as an abused puppy and tried to treat it like nothing had happened at all. I would eat with them, watch TV with them, and even when I was feeling brave, go with them to go shopping. But I never felt genuine. Tempe did his best to cheer me up, but a little voodoo doll can really only do so much. Each day dragged on and on. Alexander tried to talk to me into seeing a therapist, but what therapist would look at me and be able to help me? Then I bet you guys are wondering about the elephant in the room, my blackouts, and my murderous tendencies. They haven't gone away. Where would they have gone, after all? I didn't notice it before. But people have been dying in our neighborhood, and more than a few of my clothes had to be gotten rid of. Otherwise people would have seen the blood. Alexandra knows. Oh, of course she knows. She walked in on me climbing back into my room with blood all over me. Lucky for me, we understand each other. She doesn't tell, and I don't hurt her. There isn't much more I need to tell you anymore. After all, I can't have any of you finding out where I live and operate. Can't have any of you stopping my fun. Although, I will leave you all with the promise of something in the future. After all, the flyer that was delivered in the mail says it will. Coming soon, the grand reopening of the half-priced voodoo store. Hopefully they're hiring. I have plenty of experience. After all... Thank you.